Who's here for the first time? Oh, look, you're all here for the first time. <laughs> well, for you. <laughs> uh, please come back. You'll see it from the list. We've got all sorts of people. Um, tomorrow we've got the Waymers. I don't know why they're coming. But uh, <laughs> next week... <laughs> very glamorous. The first black marchioness uh, in Britain. We've got Jimmy Carr next week, Hannah Rothschild, Nicholas de Rota, Andrew Marr, Nicholas Parsons, who is 92. Um, Julian Fellows and Kirsty Young. And we just heard Maria Testino is coming on the 29th of June. So you want to <coughs> register for that. Now look, today we're very, very lucky to have Anthony Gormley. And uh, as you know, Anthony Gormley is not only an outstanding artist, but an intellectual and highly intelligent. <laughs> went to Trinity, Cambridge, went to the Slade, went to St. Martin's Art School, doctorates at four universities at least, which means this, if you don't ask an intelligent question, <laughs> you will be passed over and branded a fool, <laughs> and never be allowed to come back to the China tank, China exchange. What happens is I'm going to have a conversation with Anthony for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'm going to let you go and ask all sorts of questions, and also for Anthony to use uh, his wonderful images to show you what he wants to show you. Yeah, I think, I think it's important that you know that they're just going to run on. I'm not going to talk to them so that if I'm boring, he, he can never be boring, but if I'm boring, you can just watch the pictures go by. Are you a, a religious person? That's a big question, David. I know. Just answer yes or no is fine. <laughs> well, it's not as simple as that, is it? Um, I, I well, you can say sort of. Yes, sort of no. I mean, for example, let me ask you this. Are you a regular churchgoer? Absolutely not. But you are, do you consider yourself Catholic? Absolutely not. Christian? No. Is it because of the way you were brought up that you have rebelled against it? Yes. Because, I don't know whether you know, but... Anthony's parents were very uh, Catholic parents. And in fact, your name is Anthony Mark David Gormley, which is A-M-D-G, which for the Latin scholar stands for Ad Meorem Dei Gloria. Gloriana, which, if you are even more intelligent and intellectual, or recognize it as the motto for the Jesuits that St. Ignatius founded. But what puzzles me was that they were so keen to make you have, those, have that acronym when in fact you were the last of the seven children. So what the hell did they call the other six <laughs> when you were so erudite as being carrying a motto for the Jesuits order. I mean, did your siblings have Jesus Christ superstar and, <laughs> and God knows what? Uh, I, I have no idea. Uh, it seems, you know, that this was a brilliant idea of my dad's just, um, you know, before I was born. And, uh, yeah, it's bugged me ever since, but there we go. Uh, you live with what you've got. And uh, in, ma in many ways, I just remember um, Stanley Spencer trying to, um, yeah, excuse why he was the way he was. And he said that, uh, yeah, um, a jackdaw fell down the chimney um, on the, uh, the, ar the arrival of him into the world. And he took that as a kind of omen that somehow uh, he was going to be special. Um, but I, I, I don't feel special. I think that oh, it's a very... Were you conscious of the fact that you were brought up in a very Catholic family? I mean... No, you, because you when you, you know, we, we, we get born and whatever surrounds us as children we take to be normal. 
And you only realize how crazy it is um, when you sort of reach the age of um, a little bit more than reason. So I think I, think I, was, I was aware by the time I was 17 that actually the extraordinary pyramidal hierarchy that was, you know, had God at the top and me very much at the bottom um, was a human construct and that this needed to be deconstructed. And I, I suppose... Did you, not, did you not enjoy Ampleforth? I, I really did enjoy Ampleforth. And I think that in, in, in terms of having significant others, uh, the extraordinary thing about being taught by... Was Basil Hume there? Yes, Basil Hume was master of St. Edmund's, um, or St. Edward's, rather. I'm a bit rusty about all the houses. But anyway, the point, the point is that here you have... Um, men who have a spiritual vocation who are not career teachers. And in terms of yeah, the support that I got at Ampleforth, it was absolutely incredible. And, and they were obviously interested in the whole of me. It wasn't about how many... And it prepared uh, you for many, Trinity Cambridge? Yeah. Um, but by the time why you I, left, Why I got there, I have no idea. But, well, um, you were obviously anyway. good enough. But, I mean, by that time, did you gradually abandon or start to forget about uh, the, the faith? I think it was pretty instant, really. It was the well, combination. The moment you got into Trinity. Well, the minute, yeah, no, it was, a, I, I remember it was very quick, actually. They gave me uh, Le Don to read, um, that extraordinary uh, uh, French structural anthropological work on the cooler ring, and uh, um, they got me drunk. But in the first week, that was part of the, um, and then sex came pretty soon after that, and then, and then, uh, yeah, marijuana and LSD, and and uh, they seem to be, in terms of mind expansion and uh, realizing about the energies inherent in life, um, yeah, very important lessons, and certainly, um, yeah, better than my first communion, which was a, <laughs> yeah, that was a bit of a dud. Have you ever been to confession? Yeah, I used to go regularly. Um, but what did you confess? Well, all the things that you w would confess, you know. Wanking, having, uh, you know, how do having you, evil... How do you have say it to the priest? I, 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 I remember I, saying... I think wanking wasn't used as a word. Yeah, I know. Uh, at, I mean, I used days. to say I did something naughty to myself. Something ah. like that. Right. I can't actually remember. It was all, I always used to go to Father Pryor, and he was very, he was very, Father Anthony, he was, he, he was very kind of understanding about everything. And it was very, very strange actually being at Alforth, because the monks would dress as monks most of the time, but then they would dress as other things. So oh, Father what? Anthony would dress up as a, as a country squire on the Saturdays. A country, and, sorry, and country no, a country squire. A country squire yeah. uh, with the, yeah, the tweed jacket and the double... Um, you know, 12 bore and go out and shoot pheasants. Uh, and then on Mondays, um, he would be dressed as a, as an officer of, um, yeah, the, an infantry regiment. <laughs> so, I mean, it, that was quite, that, that was quite a good lesson in kind of shape changing and identity that you could be one thing. One but when you went up to Trinity, did you feel consciously that that's where your uh, intellect uh, start to develop, and indeed, immediately afterwards, you went off to India to seek um, greater inspiration, I suppose. Was yeah, it, happened at, it, it happened at exactly the same time, I think, the, the um, leaving Ampleforth, getting into Cambridge, and, I mean, this is, you know, 1968, 69, so we're, you know, uh, les événements. Uh, w w were happening in Paris. It was very, it was very quick to take uh, to take fire here. Uh, in yeah, in '69, there was already uh, some rumbling of, of student revolution. But by 1970, um, I was amongst those who who uh, yeah, occupied the Senate House and demanded that there should be student representation on on the university board, that uh, women should be al allowed to be part of uh, the university. And we were quite successful. But anyway, the, the, I think the, those uh, 
I think, revolutions of where, uh, you know, well, how can we say, where new things were, were, were happening. I think we're, we're also connected to uh, an attraction to alternative cultures and alternative ways of being. And I became friendly very early on with um, Charles Hastings, uh, for instance, who was, I suppose, the great-great-grandson of one of the viceroys of India. And he was very interested in, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, he encouraged me to go. And so I went with a very good friend, Charles Chubb. We were going to go by m motorbike, but in the end we hitchhiked. Uh, well, as far as we could hitchhike, as far as Istanbul, and then uh, took... But it seemed that you transferred your, uh, your spirituality uh, away from Catholicism, but nonetheless, you remain, I mean, you seem to me still a very spiritual person. I mean, you speak with passion about your body, your soul, your space, your place, uh, with great spirituality. W would you say that that's, that's correct? I, I'm very yeah, worried about using that word spiritual or spirituality too loosely. I think you're right that you know, I, I grew up in a very devout family and at school we prayed whatever it was, seven or eight times a day. I think that that marks you for life and w if you've if you've, as it were, been brought up with that within a system that is that dominant, um, I think you spend your life trying to replace it with something of equal value. Um, I think the 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 heaven hell uh, sin grace dialectic is actually a very dangerous tool in the hands of uh, 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 teachers and parents. I think that the monks weren't as, as strict in a way as my father. Um, you know, if I got excellent on my report, I would get five quid. Five, no, maybe not five quid, that would be far too much. Five shillings. I think it was two and the six for a good. Five shillings for an excellent. Um, and, um, yeah, like nine p for... Um, satisfactory or something. <laughs> uh, but then it would be, then I would get beaten for, um, you know, he, he has uh, missed class or he has uh, misbehaved in any way. And equally, you know, uh, Latin declensions, um, my father would, yeah, take me, take me to the nursery to learn aged eight. Uh, that terrible green Latin primer, the name of which I've forgotten because it was all so painful but uh, anyway the idea the idea of a parental order that was somehow condoned and excused by a, by a by a divine order um, was something that I wanted to replace by uh, I, I guess thinking about yeah you know, what is what what is existence what is what is human nature what is consciousness and I found that yeah you know, Going and studying Buddhist meditations um, gave me greater answer to those kinds of questions than yeah, Catholicism. Yeah, so uh, it's a kind of spirituality. But, okay, let me ask you another big question. I've, I've known you from, from afar for, for many years, and I'm a great admirer of your works and so forth. It seems to me you're one of the very few people who do figurative art, what I call figurative art, in the sense that it's not, when I look at your works, it's, it's, your body, it's, it's not only a body, but it's your body most of the time, and uh, most of the sculptures you do, and installations, or whatever, um, have got a shape. We can relate to it, somebody crouching down, somebody with wings, a hundred people standing around the beach, and so forth. Uh, what I was astonished was when I watched your um, TED talk, and I watched this this morning at about 5 o'clock when I got up, and uh, I couldn't go to sleep, so I thought I'd do some homework. And I actually wrote down what you said, 
And um, here it is, the famous sculpture you have, another place, you know, as you all know, a hundred pieces of Anthony Gormley looking out to sea over a three square mile, across a stretch of water, a three mile incredible tide and so forth. This is what you said on a TED talk, right? Now, a TED talk is usually supposed to be more avancular than an Oxford Union debate or an uh, intellectual, because most of the people who go there are a bit thick. But, um, but there it is. And this is what you said. And I want you to remind yourself what you said and tell us what it means. Because I can enjoy everything in front of me, and this is what we, you said. Can we use, in a way, a body as an empty catalyst for a kind of empathy with the experience of space-time as it is lived, as I'm standing here in front of you, trying to feel and make a connection in this space-time that we are sharing? Can we use it, as it were, the memory of a body of a human space in space to catalyze an experience against first-hand experience of elemental time, human time, industrial time, tested against the time of the tides in which these memories of a particular body that could be any body multiplied in the time of mechanical reproduction, many times placed over three square miles a mile out of sea, disappearing in different conditions of day and night. What the hell is going on? <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I don't recognize um, quite You said this. I, yeah, I, yeah, dictate, okay, okay. I dictated I, I'm, it. I'm sure it took me half an hour to write it down. <laughs> okay. Here it is. All right. Very good. Um, <laughs> so let's start um, with first thing. So I, basically... Most of the bodies in sculpture are idealized, and they're usually made by men, and usually they're sexy women's bodies that are made at arm's length, often in marble, sometimes in clay, translated into bronze. Uh, I, my, my beef on this is very simple. Why make a s another body when you have one already? And furthermore, that you live inside, so you can work, as it were, from the other side of appearance. And I guess, yeah, my, my wager is, is it, is it possible to use your own body as a... It, it is simply an object in space, but it also happens to contain your consciousness. Can, can you use it as a primary material uh, to convey feeling? And I think that... that the, the truth claim of the work is that this is a register of a lived moment of real time, human time, that is then translated, as I probably was trying to say, into iron, which means that... It, it all it, clapped, it, by it, the way. It goes, it goes into industrial time, which, which in, 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 many terms, in many terms is kind of contesting biological time. And then I guess I want to put that in another place into the elements, into a place where I guess our time so now, so which is clock time, is contravened by somehow sidereal time, by the time of, yeah, of the moon and its, and, and its rhythm. And I guess the, the idea of that is here are many bodies that then constitute a place, so it's less about singular objects, it's a, it's a field effect where you are invited to, to, to become part of the work and you, and you move between its, between its parts and you may actually live with it. People who live on Crosby see it in many conditions, in many weather uh, conditions. And I guess, you know, for me I'm very interested in what sculpture can do. Sculpture can I think, not simply just be a special object um, in a museum or um, on a plinth in a home. It can actually question the world that it is in. And for me, um, 
the wonderful thing about sculpture is that it doesn't need a frame and it doesn't need a label and it doesn't, need, it doesn't even need a roof or, or walls. It, is, it can simply be an object in the world. And it can change people's minds and connect with people's feelings. And is I it think necessary for any of us to appreciate your wonderful work and other plays without understanding or inquiring half of these intellectual concepts that you have expressed? No, uh, I mean, you just see a child um, and they know exactly. I've just, I've just ma made a piece in San Gimignano. So if any of you are in Tuscany for the next, in the next three months, please go and see it. There's an old cinema that is now a gallery called Arte Continua. And I've put uh, about 23 kilometers of bungee, which if you don't know what bungee is, it's the stuff that you use to put your luggage on the roof of a car. Um, but this is specially made, and it has sort of a silvery, silky cover. Um, and they're about seven meters high, and they're three different diameters. But anyway, it's basically filling the entire, it's uh, yeah, 4,000 lengths of this vertical bungees that feel a bit like a rainstorm or a, yeah, a bad mist. Um, and these little kids came in, and they didn't, they didn't ask any questions. They just ran straight into this thing and started like banging around inside it. And it was just so fantastic, because they, they, there was just this immediate physical reaction. I know, that's my point. Is that and, and, I and basically, it's exactly the same with another place. Oh, you come to the beach, and you think, my goodness, there's already some people here. Then you realize that they're not really people. They're actually <laughs> rusty, rusty iron men. And you, go, uh, and you go and look at them. And then you knock them. And you see, oh, they're not hollow. They're actually solid. And, um, and then you see that maybe that some are standing on little plinths and others are quite buried. And then you realize that maybe they're all on no, the level. No, it's an, an incredible experience. I, I grant you that. But my question is that, you know, can we, would you allow people, do you think that people who don't have that, who have not heard your TED talk or understood it, should be able to enjoy it as a child, in your case, in Tuscany, looking at the bungee and, um, and just wanting to jump on it and so forth? W would you not be... Would you be contemptuous of their laziness in no, not No, of course I would. This is not an intellectual exercise. I just think, that, you know, you could say that the, the very reason that I'm a sculptor is to react against the, you could say, the, the imposition of hermeneutics. We, 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 continually, we continually translate first-hand experience into, into words or images now because we're all... Well, we live in selfie land, don't because we? Because your things um, are incredible. I mean, obviously, you know, the Angel of the North is, an ex is an as another astonishing piece of, of work of art. And, um, and yeah, but it's big, and it's a thing, and it, and it sits there in the valley, and, and you can see it, you know, passing by at 70 miles an hour, or you can get out of your car and go and sit on its feet. And the, so far as I'm concerned, you know, Sculpture is about making material things that actually resist being turned into words. They, they encourage first-hand experience. And I would like to think that my sculptures, e even though they may be, you know, a hundred versions of me or whatever, a hundred is, body, that, a, is hundred that a model of you, 20 Well, meters. sort of. I mean, no, it was a, it, that, that was uh, a mold of me that then was cast solid, and then I cut it back 12... Which bit? All of it. 12 and a half millimetres had to come off it in order for the ribs to lie halfway between the, yeah, the, 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 sk the skin and the inner, inner side of the skin, as it were. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, the, the whole point about this body moulding, so far as I'm concerned, is that you, you can somehow escape from the accidents of appearance and make something where the feel or the attitude is the thing that is conveyed. And I, I hope with that, Angel, you know that it's lost its wings, but in some way they're, they're ever so slightly, about three degrees forward, forward, and it sort of turns them from 
um, flying things into a, a kind of em embrace. And it's things like that. You, you, if you go and sit underneath it, there's, there's just something to do with vulnerability and protection in spite of its, in spite of its size. And it's things like that. I, g I guess you know what I'm trying to get at here, and it's a really important point. I, I don't. I think that sculpture is not about uh, you know having an idea and then making it, hoping that the idea will be conveyed through what you have made. I think it's about thinking physically and materially. And I get very upset if people say. Somebody said to me last week, um, you know, your work is very cerebral, and. I probably don't do any any favors by talking uh, very rubbishly. You like say this. that again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, because actually the, the whole the whole point of m making these things that can exist anywhere is that they are silent and still, and they're not shouting. Uh, they're not. But they're not. But they're, not they're not. They're not a message that has to be read. But you say that. I mean, I keep coming, uh, when, you, when you describe your work, you are incredibly intellectual. I mean, I, I, I like the challenge, but it's perfect fodder for, you know, For PhD. Suits Corner. I've been in Suits uh, no, Corner not Suits at Corner least three times. But, but, you know, PhD students have all... Mm. And, well, uh, they've got to be kept busy, uh, haven't they? Uh, what? I mean... No, there are a few... There are, you there won are the Turner Prize, um, yeah. you know. It's a 25 tonnes of clay energised by fire sensitized by touch and made conscious by being given eyes. A well, that's fair, fairly straightforward, isn't which it? Which looks at the observer, making him or her his ob subject. But that was in 1994, so mm. you've become much more intellectual since then to the TED Talk, which no, is... But no, but this, this, yeah. he's describing now a field. I don't know how many of you have seen field, but I've just, I've just installed... It's a successor to another one which you previously did in Australia, right? Yeah, well done. You used yeah, the Chinese good. for the Australian, but you used... No, 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 English. I'm sorry. The Australian was made by Australians. The, um, the, Asian, the, field, the Asian field was made by Chinese. Much by cheaper. No. <laughs> uh, yes. I the, the, think the that the Australians were free. Well, and, I mean, there was a and cost. The, the Chinese... You slave uh, the Chinese and then the Australian, but you... you no, sorry, the Australians were first and they were free. The Chinese were... By far the best paid, well and then. they got lunch. Yeah, good quality. Well, we had fantastic cooks. I think that was always <laughs> part of the deal. This was, you know, this is a project where you, where you say, let's take the clay from underneath people's feet, allow them to uh, come together and shape it. Um, and it's really hard work. It's like it is like agricultural work indoors. Um, and yeah, for the for the. For the Asian field, we had 130 tons of clay and five days and 350 makers and 150 people either making food or preparing the clay or delivering the clay. And it was terrific fun. Um, and uh, I loved your, uh, your, uh, your one another where, uh, you know, you all know about the fourth plinth and um, Trafalgar Square. And um, you remember Anthony Gormley did a series where he invited people to just stand on this plinth for an hour and do whatever they want. I think you had... Did you apply, David? Uh, no, I, I'm too fat to be able to get up the plinth. <laughs> uh, and um, I'll probably be blown over because of my own mass. But, but I mean, I, I remember it. I mean, it was, it was very amusing. I mean, were you amused by the whole thing? You had about, I don't know, 300 people, volunteers. Um, 2,400, because it was, it was 100 days, 24 hours a day, day and night, rain and shine. And uh, it was terrific. It was a sort of test of the British Did spirit. You do it? Did you do I it? applied, and I was I was refused. You were it was rejected. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a very it was very important. It was very you know. Were there any strippers? Democratic. Oh yes. Oh right, I missed that. There were <laughs> there were at least five uh, examples of nudity of different. Anyway, I, I just want mm. to ask you the la not last year the last question. But it was probably that we recently met in Hong Kong when you came out and uh, did a wonderful series of those um, figures which you've done in uh, other cities and uh, Anthony put all these figures up on the edge of buildings and uh, we Chinese didn't know who he was and we r most of the people rang up the police and said that people were jumping off the buildings. <laughs> were you amused by that? Well, I'm afraid it has happened more than once um, and 
what they after. actually jumped. No, no, no. They don't. No, obviously, the sculptures don't jump, and they're not about jumping. Uh, but I quite understand that if you see um, a naked silhouette of somebody uh, against the sky on the edge of a building, you might think that they were suicide attempters. But actually, after looking for about five seconds, I think you can tell the difference between somebody about to jump and some thing that is um, relatively stable and, and still. Um, so there's always been. So when we did Event Horizon here, there were a flurry of calls for the first three hours, and then they went away. And, and certainly, yeah, I remember the, 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 um, the headline at the front of the Yorkshire Post was, what boneheaded idiot thought it was a good idea after 9 and 11 to put bodies on top of buildings. Um, and, uh, but Michael Bloomberg was very good, and he said, uh, it was us, and uh, it was a, it was a sign that this city is alive and well, and that we can withstand these kinds of uh, yeah terrorist um, good, trauma. No, listen, I've hogged the, uh, the the floor. Who has got an intelligent or intellectual question? No, on? please, we don't need intellectual questions. Just uh, well, good, one minute. good ones. Go on, quick. Don't stand there. Anticipate. Look, if you want the microphone. <laughs> Stick your hand up so that these people can see it. They're half blind. Hello, good evening. Uh, in high school, my French literature teacher used to tell us that art is an eternal teenager in the sense that artists should find a way to innovate and to provoke the public with their creation. Considering the liberalization of Western societies, do you think we have arrived at a point um, in time where nothing in art may shock us anymore? Is that for David or me? Uh, Are you trying to do a TED talk? No, what, uh, what, what is your question? We, is that we can art shock? Um, well, considering the liberalization um, of Western societies, um, do you think we have arrived at a point in time um, where nothing in art shock us anymore? For example, the change in morals, etc. Um, right. Uh, next question. <laughs> Yes, I suppose art, of course, shocks. I mean, you know, most of the things Anthony does are very innovative. I mean, I'm answering for him, but anyway, go on. Hi, it's my first time here, and I really like it. Enjoy it. Good. Um, my name What's is your number? <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Aliona. I'm portrait photographer, and currently I'm working on a book dedicated to contemporary artists. Mm -hmm. And every artist I photograph has the same question. What's your definition of beauty? Golly. I, I think that, um, you know, beauty has to somehow uh, surprise us. And it's interesting that, that, that I think many things that we think of as beautiful today might have been thought of as quite ugly at the time of their, of their birth. When I think of, you know, Delaunay or... Um, Franz Marc um, painting horses bright red. Um, and I think the, the uh, yeah, for me, the challenge of beauty is to somehow escape from convention. And the, the, the idea of perfection particularly. So I think for me, beauty, beauty is about energy and about somehow um, managing to make, I guess, a, a, a place in which you can feel energized by what it is that you're engaging with. And uh, it's interesting how, how definitions of beauty evolve, and I think that's one, of, that's one of art's jobs, to somehow liberate us from convention and find those places that can reactivate our sense of, of being alive, alert, aware. Um, and I guess, you know, this connects with the previous question because the, I don't think shock for its own sake is uh, a very good strategy. However, I think really good art, even for the person who is making it, has to shock you 
In other words, it has to it has to strike you suddenly that you've done something, and it's usually an accident um, that has changed the way you're looking at the world. So the first time, you know, the first time that I realized that I could stand a body on the wall, for example, which was just having seen uh, one of my works about to be packed and lying on its back. I mean, this is a really basic thing and being carried by a, by a forklift and suddenly realizing if I stand that on the wall, it suddenly acts as a lever and the whole, the whole room begins to turn and it actually affects the way, it physically affects the way I, f I feel standing here. Um, and I guess it's things like that, that that for me are are the key to beauty. Somehow finding a way of looking again at what is already there, um, in a in a way that changes the world, changes the way that you feel in the world. I understood that. Sure. What did he say? Repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> now I I suppose I mean you can't really define it, but I mean. For me, I know something's beautiful when I see it, and it's not Theresa May, anyway. <laughs> Go on. Um, is there a piece of advice or feedback which you've had which has influenced you or your work as an artist, or your work? The, um, I think always it's other people who've gone before you, so I, I became very good friends with... Uh, Walter de Maria, who made extraordinary works like The Earth Room or like The Lightning Field in New Mexico. This is a, this is a piece, 200, very highly polished stainless steel uh, needles that exists near Cuamado in New Mexico on a very high plateau at about uh, 4,500 feet up. Very, very clear thin air um, and he he it wasn't just what he said to me he just said you know keep going Anthony what you're doing I can see what you're doing just keep keep going um, was really simple advice um, but was I think something that I've listened to and and followed in other words even if you don't understand exactly what you're doing if you give the work time it will begin to talk to you and I used to think I used to think that I was kind of the sole the sole author of, of the work and I now think that the work in, in, in a sense is is making me rather than the other way around and our you know I, I now work with a lot of assistants and I think that the, the, the main thing that all of us do is look and look and look again at what we've just made in order to listen to what it's telling us about what to do next. And it's like the work is in charge. And I think that's, I think that's simply a result of, of, of carrying on, uh, of not being de deflected or distracted. And in the end, I think, you know, work comes out of work. And uh, early advice from Walter just saying, keep going. That was just really simple and really good advice. At church, you said, if you're in hell, keep going. Hi, good evening. Thanks very much. Um, really interesting pictures. My interest is in science. And as a scientist, I ask about human centricity um, as we lose 30,000 species every year. Mm and the rock that we're living on becomes more and more dead. Um, do you think that's reflected in what you're doing? I think that uh, a work like uh, Field in you know, all its forms um, is absolutely asking that question, wh what, what, what is happening about the, this extraordinary success of our species and to what to what extent are is our future dependent on actually the extinction of other forms of life? 
And I think another place, the work in the sea, is, I suppose, a reflection on um, what Conrad Shawcross said. Um, you know, migration is older than language. We, in some senses, in order to become successful, have have continually uh, you know, colonized new continents, uh, often extinguishing other hominid societies that uh, were not as rapacious as ourselves. And I guess um, the fact that sculpture is a still silent object it's a good it's it, it's a good instrument for asking really simple questions what what is a human being what are what is the human future to what extent do human futures uh, uh, lie in sympathy with all life forms and 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 the planet and to what extent are they distinct from it uh, I, I would like to think that art it, it itself is a open space in which uh, you know, questions about human nature and whether we can whether we can talk about human nature uh, in bland terms or whether we've actually now that we have constructed a world we we, we know that over fifty percent we we passed that 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 moment in. 2008, where over 50% of our species lived in the city. By the middle of this century, it'll be more like 75%. We spend increasing amounts of our time sitting on our asses. We don't, we don't move anymore. We're not, we're not, as it were, integrated anymore with with the, the elemental world. A lot of our motivation now comes from from the meta world of of. Uh, digitally exchanged information. And I guess uh, part of me placing these objects often within the elements rather than in within the protected zones of our institutional life or indeed within galleries is just to ask those really simple questions. To what extent, do, to what extent does human being uh, uh, depend upon the wider systems, and certainly another place is evident. Um, this is this is immersed in everything to do with uh, climate change and and the rising sea levels and uh, the fact that there is no other place. I made it first in response to a commission from Cuxhaven, where m many people bet between the, the 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 fall of the Weimar Republic and the rise of National Socialism left left the European continent in order to find a new life in America. I think this, this you could say that now between the, the refugee and, and, and the tourist, we are all migrants. There's a moment now where ev everybody is somehow moving. The, the, whole, the whole human kind of encirclement of the globe is, is in motion. But there is, we, we know that there's nowhere else to go. So th I think the big, you know, the the big the big question behind the work is, you know, who who is this for? Who does it represent? Can it become uh, collective? I think that's another thing that I've been very keen to do to make to make work like the field works that are, you could say, tribal in their genesis, um, and escape from uh, the, mar the the commodification and market. Um, forces that seem to uh, have taken hold of art. It's not. It's not very long ago when, when, in in a, in a sense, art was always collective, and it, the place in which it was enjoyed was usually the shared spaces of of uh, you know religion or or um, civic buildings. Um, so it's a very strange time now, um, and I want I, I I just think that sculpture is an extraordinary. I mean, it is of its nature social. It is of its nature in a, in, a, in a sense a place in which uh, collective values can be tested, can be can be materialized, and can be um, shared. So 
I don't know. I, I, I think uh, I would like to think that the making of art and particularly sculpture is in its core uh, an act of hope because you you make something you know in your own space but you don't put it out there you put it in the road you put it on a mountain you put it on a building you put it you put it on the beach um, and it changes the world it changes ideally it changes the, w w the way people think when they walk past it and maybe changes their mood that's an extraordinary thing I, th I think that's the power that that's its power there is no direct message but I think the, the, the vulnerability of um, I think all life uh, I think it's I'm very very conscious of I am very aware that that our success has been at the expense of other life forms and and in some senses um, not not in a agitprop way I think that those things are reflected in the in the work. Sorry, that was a very long <laughs> reply, but this that's a very big issue. Um, yeah. Is there anything flippant or um, bit of a laugh? <laughs> yeah, no, I. Uh, I mean, you mean pretty heavy stuff? Uh, I mean, uh, yes. The, uh, uh, I mean uh, if you if you were to come. Um, uh, to see us, I hope you will. Um, you know, in uh, in Norfolk, where we where we have a studio in the countryside. Um, you know, after after dinner, um, rather than giving you a glass of port, I I might give you a lump of clay, and we'd often do that. We have we have no, because um, I know you are very amusing. I've known you, and we joke and so forth. And suddenly, uh, you know, your whole body of work is one huge. Um, you know, Aristotelian world of, of, um, of morality and moral turpitude and darkness and death and um, I don't know. Well, no, I, I think that may be. I think that may be over overstepping yeah, it a bit. Look, this is me having fun. I'm, I'm yeah, throwing I bits of rock about. I think that, that's very uh, yeah. good. <laughs> I mean, I remember you collected all those pieces of. Yeah, I did. Yeah, this is good. This is called re. This is called rearranged desert. Yeah, this was my. That's how you rearranged it, right? You yeah, that no, that is rearranged. You've got to know the difference between a, 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 a desert as oh, you we find don't it. Know and where that is, you won't tell people. No, no. That. Well, it's, it's somewhere. In Australia. It, no, no, it isn't. In it's America. in America. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. It was. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> a shorter question. <laughs> Following on from what you've said, um, the men on the beach. Because the sea comes in and the beach takes things away and they sink, do you mean them to sink? Or have you asked the council to come dig them out? No, I'm, I, are you aware of something that I'm not? Because um, so far as I'm concerned, we put them in with um, Himmelbau, um, these wonderful chaps from Schleswig-Holstein that were very good at, at digging wells. But they, they put them all in in about four days. It was really, really... Uh, quick and simple, um, just ten foot long uh, tubes with with a, with a simple ring that had been pulled out, which was enough of a screw to pull these pipes down, and then we welded a little thing on top, and and uh, and welded them to it, and and that was whenever it was. It was a long time ago, in 1998 or maybe. Anyway, on your 10th anniversary, when you went back, you were delighted with all the barnacles. Yeah, that was incredible. That's an incredible yeah. story. I mean, but basically, they are not sinking, unless you know something that I don't. Uh, but they are all on a consistent plane, and the sand moved. The sand can scour out from underneath one and dump it on another. So sometimes they're, you know, they're some of them are more covered in sand than others. But the barnacle story is a great story because these are Pacific bar barnacles. They came on container ships from, from South China Seas and from Australia. And in fact, these barnacles are from Australia. And they just must have smelt in the water. Mm. There's some there's some nice iron around here. They're they recognize they, they, they your like field. No, no, they just like iron. They like they're bad, but they're n totally unlike our our barnacles because our barnacles look like don't they little volcanoes with little like mouth holes at the top, but these just grow and they grow and they grow until they're about this long. So, 
Anyway, it's terrific what they've done to the sculpture. Because the all the of them look out to sea. All yeah, the they all look about eight degrees north of due west. So the idea is that they, they're carrying on, in a way, looking towards America, which is what they were originally. What theory do you have in uh, Easter Island when all the figures actually look inward, inward yeah. and rather than outward? Yeah. What, what, what theory do you have? I mean, did, did they think exactly the opposite to what you thought? I think that the Maui are, uh, well, I think as far as I can tell, they're, they're facing to, to the volcano where the, where the um, this where God rock, is. rock, no, no, where they, where they came from, where the, where the stone came from. I mean, that is the only culture that has destroyed itself entirely by its love of sculpture. Looking they, they Well, no, they, they cut all the trees down to, um, to roll those extraordinary um, pieces down from, from the quarries higher up. Um, I've never, I was, I was promised a trip, and then I thought, well, I, for for the carbon footprint of my trip, to I, I just couldn't, I couldn't really justify going. Please. Going uh, for to art. No, well, I would just would no, have I been. Think there. You I would have promised us that you will go. I, 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 I would just be a tourist. I don't think that they need me to see them. I know about them. I'm passionate about them. I've seen uh, Ho Hakanan, the, the you know the one at the at the British Museum, and I go and see him quite a lot because. Uh, you know, he's a kind of inspiration. I think that they're extraordinary. They're extraordinary. And it is something to do with the fact that they don't just look out, they also look up. So there's this sense of, I don't know, of this object that immediately connects you with what it is not, space. And I think that, you know, I, l I, I think that in the end, that is what, what is at the core of the work. Okay. Activating space. Hello. Hello. As an old Amphorian myself as well, I feel I must confess that for five years I played rugby down on the old pitches and there's a statue of yours up there and I've never once been to see it, which I feel slightly bad about. It. But I was listening to your Desert Island Dis earlier uh, from Were you? 98. That was a long time ago. 98, I think it was. Mm. And uh, I was wondering which of your sculptures, if any, would you bring with you on your island? Oh, I, I don't think I'd bring any. I think... Uh, you had a pair I, of, I pair of scuba like uh, snorkel and some flippers, you said. That's right, bring. yeah, I just needed a snorkel. I thought that was a good, uh, good thing to have on a desert island. Um, no, I, I tried to make uh, some sculpture on, on the island. Uh, but it wouldn't have to last. I think, I think uh, no, the idea of taking a sculpture um, with me would be very... I think you'd want to just deal with what you had there. And uh, I suppose I'd have to make tools first, wouldn't I? Um, I'd have to learn how to nap flint, if there were flints there. Um, I'd have to learn how to make fire, wouldn't I? I mean, all of those things, which would probably take a few few years. <laughs> and then, um, and then you know, sculpture probably take, you know, th that would probably be at the end of the list. Um, Getting the food and making the house and doing all that kind of thing would probably, but I didn't. I'd enjoy all of that. And um, having made fire, you could do you could do fire sculptures. I like I like the idea of making things out of light. I'm I'm trying to do some things with light for the. I've got, I've got they've given me the Royal Academy um, in 2019. Um, so I'm thinking about. Uh, trying to take those rather heavy ancient rooms that were purpose-built for art uh, of a different sort to mine and how, how to use them in, a, in an interesting way. You did an incredible thing about light, the, the brightest light of any sculpture anybody's ever made, where you sort of disappeared in the mist. Well, it was called blind light, and, and yeah, the difficulty there, that was, that was uh, what I did for the Hayward. Um, but interestingly enough, very difficult to translate because it was it was unique to the Hayward's breathing um, system. It, it, the Hayward is a, a fantastic building, which has these huge ducts that allows it to change its air and keep it cool. Um, and I've done it two times since w with much greater difficulty. But no, that was a good that was a that was a nice piece. How many of you saw um, Blind Light? A few. 
I'm glad you did because it, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's... It sort of disappeared into it. That's right, yes. It was, it was about um, 2,000 uh, lux of light at about uh, maybe 2,400 Kelvin and uh, at one and a half atmospheres at, at about... Um, it's about 10 times the density of a normal cloud because these were... These, these droplets were formed by uh, ultrasonic humidifiers, and they were absolutely fantastic. But anyway, you, you walked through an ever-open threshold, and it was blinding light, but at the same time you couldn't see anything. So you, you'd hold your hand out in front of you, and you couldn't see it. Okay. Um, Question? Well, that was good. Hi, Auntie. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a collector with a spiritual art collection, I'm also a spiritual artist. Um, I've shown my works to, um, I'm speaking from a point of view of still an unrepresented artist. Um, I've shown my works to um, Ai Weiwei's gallerist in Germany. He says, I'm very honored. Um, I get responses such as um, from people saying, um, this reminds me of giving birth to my child and the creator of the Thai Pavilion in Venice calls me a genius, but I've never sold a single piece of art in my entire life. And I'm still unrepresented. And some of these galleries have my money <laughs> um, as a collector. So what, what advice would you give me, an unrepresented artist? Um, carry on. You just told her that. Guy. Yeah, yeah. Carry, carry on. Now, I think the, 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 the simple thing uh, to say is go, go to the shows and visit the galleries whose art you love. Uh, and basically make friends. Um, I think that, that artists help other artists. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing what I am doing today without the help of... It's not just Walter, it's a, a lot of people. And I think the... the it's an extraordinary... If, if you allow yourself to follow your, uh, the things that you are attracted by, you will find friends. I think that's the. It's about friendship, really, and um, I think that's an extraordinary thing that I would say to anybody that if you keep doing what you're doing with passion and sincerity, people will help you. Um, so I think, yeah, just keep going. Anyway, if you're a genius, I guarantee you'll be discovered, as you have said. Hi, Anthony. I'm just wondering who's your uh, favourite artist and why? Sculptor and why? Gosh, um, I I think that probably um, Brancusi stays as my sort of all-time uh, favourite because there's there's something there's something about his attitude to light and material that is infinitely inspiring so wh where was the question I th ah, right the the and then yeah I go t I go to his studio whenever I can the one that is preserved by the by the Pompidou and I just think that that's a kind of example of a space that has yeah been devoted to uh, slowing things down and thinking at the speed of material and uh, you can see and feel in that space how one thing has been, if you like, the parent or the or the progenitor of an of another. So the you know there are five endless columns and and these wonderful cups that that sit slightly wonkily on 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 top of a mantelpiece, um, and then you know, his fishes and birds in space. Um, and there's something, I suppose it's, Brancusi ha has this, uh, I was going to say peasant, and it's not peasant that, but it, it's, it's just a almost basic necessity uh, attitude to making, which I, just find very, very um, 
comforting, I think, is the right way. And, the, uh, you know, that that he could spend, you know, two, two years on uh, my Astra. Um, and, but he lived with it and would polish it. And when you went to visit him, you know, he would pull the, pull this dust cover off and there it would be um, beaming in the light. Um, and there's something, there's just something about this steady life that, that um, yeah, that believes in making as a way of living. That, yeah, inspires uh, uh, we're, we've got about three or four hands. There's, there's, there's let's have a blitz of short questions. Very unintelligent question answer, actually. Um, I first came across. Put, put your. I yeah. first came across another place a couple of years ago, and um, my dog found it very interesting because he would run between every single man that he could find and urinate against it. <laughs> but uh, no, the question is that there's also one of those sculptures as well that I came across accidentally in a in the River Thames, at the back of a pub, which I believe is owned by Sir Ian McKellen. Mm. Um, is there a story behind that, or did you just put it there so dogs couldn't urinate against it? Uh, it's no, it's a good question. Time. Very good question. No, it was, um, I'm, I met, I don't know why, but um, Ian and I happened to be staying in the same hotel in Perth, Western Australia, uh, and I had just finished Inside Australia, and uh, and I, yeah, anyway, we, we became friends, and he went out and saw it, and anyway, then we were knocking about in London, and he just said, look, look, Anthony, I really, really need one of your pieces. And I said, well, yeah, you, know, you just go to White Cube and get one. <laughs> uh, and uh, no, he said, I really need one of your pieces. I mean, if you're I said, well, look, if you ask me to give you one of the pieces, you, you, can, you can have it for what it costs to cast, but it's got to be in the river because um, I want it to be part of, in a way, bigger London than your front room. And... Uh, you're going to have to. You're going to have to, you know, get permission from the um, Thames Water Authority and all that. And I, I thought he didn't have a chance in hell, but uh, <laughs> Ian is so charming and so persuasive um, that he, of course, did get permission, and so he got the work. And uh, no, it's lovely. I've got to go. I've got to go in July and do the um, the um, bird poo removal party. Uh, which uh, has to coincide with a with a, a high tide and a small boat, um, and I'm not sure whether Ian's going to join me. But he's, he he um, will will have uh, one, once all the poo is removed, we will um, we'll maybe have a drink to celebrate that it's been deguanoed. Yeah. Anyway. Are there poo on those uh, in Crosby? Well, no. I, I think that that they don't seem. They get washed by the sea basically yeah. every day, so they're they're not so pooey. But but um, no, Ian's gets really shitty. I mean, <laughs> uh, and and he doesn't like it. I told him that he just should live with it. But he, they they go completely white. It goes completely white on on the head. So anyway, I said that we we should um, have a poo party, and uh, he seemed okay. Quickly, uh, two questions. Hi, Anthony. Uh, Hi. Well, you love sculpture and how it's great for its physicality and you, know, you can put your consciousness in there and all that. But um, if there's such importance that you prescribe to materiality and stuff, why are you making print now all of a sudden? Why am I seeing prints in galleries of yours? Yeah, it's interesting. I think the print, the, the print is a... Uh, I mean, that did you, you saw that last show at Alan Christea. Well, every time I make a print, I'm trying to do something different. So I'd never done... Um, really big uh, wood woodblock prints, and at the same time as doing the woodblock prints that w I guess we're trying to talk about human space as architecture, I decided to do monoprints, which I hadn't done before, and that was where I just covered myself in Texan crude oil and 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 uh, uh, yeah petroleum jelly. It was disgusting and. And I don't want to do it again, but it was quite interesting what it meant in terms of the way that the the the, the prints paired each other. Um, so you had this uh, almost like yeah the X-ray of a 
very tight building to a body, and then this very immediate, I just sort of fell, having covered myself in onto, onto a paper. So you had this absolutely basic uh, indexical sign of a human life. And I, um, anyway, I think probably I like prints because they are about impressions and they, um, and you can make more of them, therefore they can be sold cheaper and it's a form of democratization, I suppose. Um, and money. And money, you need money to do the next thing. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, All right, it's a good thing. Last question. What was the most interesting experience you had with LSD and did it influence you in any way? Yeah, good question. Um, my last LSD trip was not my best. Um, that was uh, in Calcutta uh, in the Bengali State Museum. Bad, bad place. <laughs> Very bad place to trip. Um, I think um, I can't really um, recall one particular. I think probably the second trip, which was somewhere between Notting Hill Gate and Pimlico, uh, was interesting because I think that was that was one of those moments, rather like what Aldous Huxley describes in The Doors of Perception, where somehow I was made aware of the underlying structures of, of matter and how mind and matter in some senses interconnect. And the thing that I've just made for MIT, um, which is called Chord, I, I, I think you could make, you could make an, an argument that those two experiences, uh, the experience of making that work and that, that early LSD trip, um, were connected. There's a, there's a. Uh, I think we, 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 certainly in my middle year, year at, at Cambridge, we, 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 we treated psychotropic drugs quite seriously. And there was, a, there was, you know, we were reading Carlos Castaneda and and, um, you know, the Tao Te Ching and uh, the Secret Life of Plants and. The, the the tower of physics and um, there's it's it's quite an interesting thing if you prepare yourself properly um, to allow I suppose a, sp a, 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 a space in which um, yeah the 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 standard cause and effect of of, of life and the way we the way we are driven by um, deadlines and work uh, duties and all of that um, allow that to be set aside and I think it without those early psychotropic experiences I think that my interest in in meditation wouldn't wouldn't have happened and so while I, I I don't think I you know I haven't I haven't bothered with any of that stuff um, for the last 30 years. Um, do you still I meditate? I do still meditate in, in ways that are now integrated with the work. So I think that the, the, making, the making now of the, the body forms that used to be, that, that used to be um, this ritual kind of moment of having to stand or lie or, or, or sit very, very still for up to an hour, two hours at a time, has now been um, replaced by, by scanning, which takes a lot less time. But still, it is a moment of intense concentration and awareness. And I think the two... I think the drugs are a very short-term and shorthand way of achieving a, a fundamental change of consciousness and I'm I'm still interested in that I'm still um, but they are uh, far far better replaced by 
by mindfulness and the disciplines of mindfulness. Well, I'm afraid we've actually overrun uh, time, but I, I forgot to ask you one question, which I can't resist. Um, are you remotely interested in, because your, the, the core of your um, works has this huge emphasis on your body being your space, your place, space-time. Does it interest you that Einstein theory of relativity would play a role in your space-time in the sense that it actually fluctuates and is not constant. But I think, you know, the, the general theory, 1915, you know, the, the, the realization that um, space is a dimension of time and time a dimension of space and that they, that they, 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 morph, they morph each other. I think that the... the I'm constantly trying, in, in, in some senses, to use mass not as an inertia, but mass actively, in the interests of actually exactly what you're saying, that, that, that um, somehow the, 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 the effect on consciousness of um, Im embodied, embodied things um, can shift, uh, shift, and maybe m maybe um, shift you and 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 your sense of being uh, into a an another space. And uh, the the work has now developed in two very distinct lines and. One is the making of environments that allow you to auto-observe. So that's what blind light is. Blind light, that there's no body represented there other than the body that the viewer brings, uh, him or herself. And then on the other hand, there are yeah, the, this, this meditation on, on or, or an, an attempt to make an account of what it feels like to inhabit a body. But but I think the two are are very allied, and they're allied to uh, I think uh, an attempt to make instruments that that, that extend right. and yeah. concentrate our. I, I know you will go on, so it is my fault <laughs> for um, uh, for bringing <laughs> it up, <laughs> trying to be intellectual, uh, because um, anyway, look, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've overrun, and uh, will you please? Join me warmly in thanking Sir Anthony Gormley. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that wasn't too much of a Thank you. Thank you.